Okay, here you are. You've got a minute to live. Someone's got a gun to your head. You're about to be executed. What? What's next? That's the question. And it's, it's a question that we all have to face. And if you've not thought about it, well, I, I'm sure everyone thinks about it at some point. Yeah, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not immortal. You know, the, each, each of us as persons is finite. And so we have to face this question. And it's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I wrote that article um, on death and nothingness and subjectivity uh, quite a few years ago. It was a cover story for a magazine called The Humanist Magazine. And um, so it's been on the website for quite a while. And But it's gotten, um, I don't know, a fair amount of, of traction. Um, and now that Sam Harris has mentioned it, of course, that's, that's really drawn a lot of visibility to it. Um, so, uh, which is nice. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that it's gotten that, that kind of attention. And uh, I, you know, the ideas are, are still, um, they're not completely original, of course, because uh, there were precursors to, the, to this idea. And uh, I think Alan Watts came close to it in one of his talks. And uh, I'm just now reading Erwin Sch uh, Schrodinger's book, My View of the World, in which uh, I think Sam Harris quoted him. Uh, from that book about something close to generic subjective continuity. I haven't quite got, gotten to the passage yet, but so it's not a completely um, original idea. Right, yeah, I, I heard, I mean, uh, Sam Harris mentioned Schrödinger's idea in, in, in the same con uh, uh, same podcast that he also read your uh, or parts of your article. Uh, but but uh, Schrödinger's approach is a little different because it's like uh, he comes from a, a idealistic uh, perspective, yep. but um, for me personally, personally, it was much uh, easier to understand, uh, you know, uh, where you came from because you take a, a, a physicalist approach. You could say, is that right? I yeah, I think that's certainly close enough. Uh, naturalistic for sure, and certainly not idealist. So yeah. I think uh, I, I pretty much start from a physicalist position uh, in the article, but of course it leaves open the, the really interesting question of, of how consciousness comes to, you know, why is it entailed uh, or a function of, of the physical brain? That's a, still an, an open question as far as I'm concerned. Right. Okay. But, but that, that's something really interesting that I also read on your website that um, you're you're basically agnostic about uh, whether or not consciousness could be a, a physical phenomenon, but then at the same time you describe yourself as a naturalist. So I, I'm curious um, because I was under the impression that naturalism entails like the physicalist worldview. So maybe you could um, explain what exactly naturalism is all about and like how it's different from atheism or or physicalism or um secularism this humanism maybe they, like draw the boundaries to these other uh, mm -hmm. worldviews sure um there's this uh, like so much in philosophy and science there's, there's no strong consensus about the you know what naturalism actually is but the way i use it is essentially a worldview that's aligned with science and, and saying what's real what's true about the about reality so you take you take science, or I do, uh, science as one, as your basic epistemology, which, you know, it's an observationally, um, experimentally based uh, way of looking at things and deciding what's true about the world. And then um, if you take that as your epistemology and stick with science, then you'll see that there's, there's nothing that we can coherently call supernatural about reality. So the reality is of a piece as shown by science. So that, the naturalism that I defend and talk about on the website is basically a worldview that contrasts naturalism with supernaturalism, which is, of course, consistent with atheism. It's consistent with humanism. It's consistent with any any worldview that essentially discounts the existence of the supernatural um, and takes a essentially a, uh, an empiricist, empir empirical way of, of deciding what's, what's real. Um, so, I don't think that naturalism, as I've just talked about it, has any definite metaphysical commitment. 
I mean, most naturalists, including myself for a long time, have been partial to physicalism because science is generally understood as studying what's out there in the physical world. Although, of course, psychology gets into the mental realm too. And then the, the question of consciousness comes up, which mm -hmm. to me is a really interesting thing. If you're a naturalist, how do you incorporate consciousness into a science-based worldview? Mm -hmm. And that's still an open question, um, which I think is, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, as, a, I, as I would put it up, metaphysically agnostic, uh, when it comes to, say, consciousness. But I'm not agnostic about the existence, say, of God, because there's no evidence for the existence of God that I've, I've seen, um, as gods are usually defined at any rate. And uh, there's no evidence that I've seen and no logical basis for supposing we have a kind of free will that can transcend a natural cause and effect view of ourselves. Um, mm. So those are some things that I would definitely maintain on my, in terms of my naturalistic orientation based in science. But when it comes to the deep meta, you know, the meta philosophically metaphysical question of, you know, what the ultimate nature of things in, in which consciousness, of course, has to be included, then I, I step back and say, well, you know, I don't need to make a commitment uh, on, on say, physicalism mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to consciousness, although. I tend to start as I did in this paper on death and nothingness from the physicalist perspective. Right. Um, so that, that, that's a, a general idea. But a lot of people do, as you, as you said, take naturalism sort of as, as the way into or equivalent to some kind of a, a physicalist materialist worldview. And, and that's understandable because mm -hmm. science tends to deal with the physical things outside the head. Right, right. But so to, to bring it back to generic subjective continuity, um, what, what kind of assumptions do you have to start out with in order to, you know, arrive at the conclusion that you want your readers uh, to arrive at, you know, because I, I've talked to many people in my circle of friends. And for me, it's difficult to suss out at which part of the argument they you know, step off the trail, uh, so to speak. I, I just want to know, um, like, what are the necessary preconditions for, what are the essential assumptions that you have to take on board in order to uh, find G uh, GSC plausible? Well, um, as I, you know, say at the beginning of the article, the, the, the assumptions are pretty much naturalistic and that uh, I take a science-based view of ourselves as physical creatures in a material world, and then consciousness itself as arising somehow, and this is the open question, arising somehow from what the brain is doing. I mean, that seems to be where all the, the empirical evidence leads us as a, as a hypothesis, not as a settled conclusion. But so the, the assumptions are really, as, as you said, a kind of physicalism about ourselves as creatures, and, uh, a naturalistic, non-dualism, um, in other words, there's nothing supernatural about ourselves. Uh, and then the idea that consciousness is uh, very likely uh, a function of what the brain is doing. So that when the person dies, there's no, there's no way that their personality or anything else about them could survive death. And that's an important part of the paper, which is to, to block the, the, the idea that there's any kind of personal continuity that's maintained after death right but but the conclusion would uh, I draw on the paper um, and others have somewhat come to the same idea is that there might be some generic subjective continuity that is continuity of experience uh, in other words at death you shouldn't look forward to being plunged into nothingness or blackness or oblivion you should anticipate that there will be more experience arising, but not in the context of being you as a, pers uh, as a particular person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember that is something, I, I think you mentioned uh, criticisms uh, of, your, of this view on your website as well, uh, namely that um, some say that the, this notion of diving into uh, an oblivion or into nothingness, that's not something that atheists really believe that some that's more to be taken poetically because 
there's no other way to express these you know these ideas so kind of how, how do you counter that do are you really uh, of the opinion that most non-religious people really think okay at, at death I, I i go down in, into a deep dark hole or into some sort of you know void basically well i, I cite plenty of examples in the page in the in the article of people who espouse exactly this point of view including some philosophers so i don't think it's a straw man but to the extent that people don't buy that view that's fine with me because that's after all the view that i'm trying to refute mm. so i mean that's fine if, if people if, if atheists and humanists really don't believe in nothingness then the question i would pose to them is what should you anticipate at death mm. Mm. that leads to my conclusion namely that you should anticipate more experience so right. it's if I'm wrong about what atheists and humanists think, or most secular folks think as a general rule, if they're merely being poetic about nothingness and blackness and oblivion, that's okay with me. Mm, right. I see what you're saying, yeah. But, but I, should, I should say, I've seen so many instances of this misconception uh, that I don't think it's a straw man. I, you know, in other words, I try to present evidence that is not a straw man that I'm I'm um, opposing here, but something that's quite real in people's thinking about their what they're anticipating at death. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as I think it's quite understandable to uh, to anticipate it because we have this natural tendency to project ourselves into a situation where the body has dissolved. And so, what's next? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a perfectly natural thing to to have in your mind as the prospect of death approaches. Mm, mm. So if one were to suppose that one is sort of plunged into blackness or nothingness, that's kind of a, a possible way of projecting yourself into a situation which you don't know what's next. Mm. But another way of projecting yourself, not you as a person, but as an, simply as an experiencing being is the continuation of experience. Because as I point out in the paper, You've never not been here as far as your experience is concerned. Mm. Right? You can't experience is always present for itself. And it happens to be present for, for itself in this context and in, in the context that's over there in Germany. Austria, Vienna. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um Close. Close. Oh. <laughs> Accent oh. is similar, yeah. Yeah, no, my apologies. Um anyway. So since experience never finds itself absent, we shouldn't suppose that we will be uh, confronted with its absence at death, which is kind of the the, the oblivion mistake. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, I, I was just going to ask you um, how you would explain to somebody who's maybe not philosophically trained or hasn't thought a, a lot about that, uh, what consciousness is because th that may be like one of the problems at least that I've encountered when I try to communicate this idea to other people that they have a differing view of consciousness for them consciousness means like the ability to uh, to think about yourself or like this this inner monologue that you have like some confuse it with the inner monologue that they have so so some people they think I like I have consciousness which I, which I think is the wrong way to look at it. It's like th there's consciousness and then within that there's your identity or the, the I is basically manufactured. Or, um, but I want to I wanna let you um, say more on, the, on this topic um, of, of consciousness. And if that, if that is in fact a, a, a problem that, that people just start out with differing um, ideas of what consciousness is. Yeah, well, of course, this debate about what consciousness fundamentally is uh, in in the in the philo scientific community, as I call it, the philo philosophical scientific community. My my uh, neologism is philo scientific um, to describe the the people who work on consciousness. Uh, it transcends the, the the boundary between philosophy and science. I don't think there's a clear boundary there anyway. But so the the conception of consciousness that I have in mind is is fairly straightforward. It's it's the idea that um whatever you are feeling right now and or seeing or experiencing the you know some the way to uh, 
point to it is, is think about in your current experience, you know, what is your visual experience like? Well, you're looking at a screen, you're, you're seeing colors, you're feeling sensations as you sit or stand, you're hearing things, you're smelling things, touching things. All of this is part of your conscious experience. So the so sensory consciousness is basic to the idea of consciousness that I have in mind. Uh, so it needn't be very complicated. It can be very simple, like the consciousness that uh, is present just as you wake up. There's perhaps a very inchoate sense of being there, but not much content for it. There's no vision, no vision, no audition, just the bare sense of being perhaps a locus of, of awareness. In fact, uh, of course, there's debate about whether it gives pure consciousness or not. But so my conception of consci consciousness has to do with sensory consciousness, emotions, perception. Uh, it doesn't have to do necessarily have to do with self consciousness. That can go away in meditative states. You can have uh, the the sense of self that you described drop completely away. And so there's simply the contents of consciousness without any sense of anyone observing those contents. Um, I've not actually experienced that, but experienced meditators can get there, I think, fairly easily. Um, that said, the sense of self is usually present uh, in in one's experience. But as you rightly said, we're not in an observational uh, relationship to our consciousness. The sense of self is part, it's an element of our conscious experience that usually is there, but doesn't doesn't have to be. I hope that is somewhat clear. Yeah, no, it is, yeah, but I, I think many people that maybe like you need a little bit of rudimentary um, experience with meditation in, in order to really have that insight or maybe like um, to feel it more viscerally, because I think that, that the, 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 this other notion of identity is much more common, like that first there's there's you and then there's your consciousness. Like uh, I think many people can't um, wrap their minds around this, that there is even even such a thing as a generic subject, like a generic subjective continuity, that there's like an underlying thing that comes before anything arises. It's I think that is the, the most difficult to part to communicate. That yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but maybe. Um, as you you said, maybe uh, some practice in meditation would sort of make this clearer. Um, there, the way I see it, there are contents being being conscious involve different contents of consciousness. The you know sensations, thoughts. I think people can understand that they can distinguish a thought from a sensation, from an emotion, and see that these are all part of their conscious experience, right? Mm. I don't think that's controversial or difficult for people to grasp. So what, what what you're saying is that people might have a sense of being what a a, a center of consciousness, uh, so that they can't understand what it would mean to be for generic subjectivity to or ge generic subjective continuity to be a possibility. Um, the way, the way I see it, the, the sense of being a self is, is kind of generic to begin with because the the me that I feel that's looking out of the world doesn't have any particular characteristics. It's simply the sense of being a self. And I, I, I would assume that you sort of feel the same way, uh, but you're, the, 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 what you sort of see in your sensory, in your experience is different, obviously, than mine, but the self that's having it is kind of already generic in a way because if I asked you, Chris, you know who who are you? Uh, you would point to all the all the possible differences between you and me in terms of what your experience is like, what your personality is like. So you're, but the sense of self that is present in your experience, I don't think can be discriminated from one person to another. And and in a way, that that sort of sense of being a perspective that's looking out at the world is what what is probably carried over. Because most centers of consciousness, I would guess, have this kind of uh, uh, self-model, as, as, as philosopher Thomas Metzger would put it, a self-model that experiences, uh, that as part of the experience, you feel like there is this self having the experience. Mm. And what, what Sam Harris is always hammering at, and I agree with him, 
is that there is no no such no real entity apart from experience that's even though it might feel like it mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a tricky question. I, I don't know that I've quite understood your your what you think people might be puzzled about when it comes to consciousness. Maybe if you want to say more, please. Um, yeah, I, I was just speculating what could be the 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 reason uh, or or the most common reason for why this argument is misunderstood. Because um, I, I don't know. It it was kind of intuitive like for me the, the the understanding of this argument and um um so i i think and and also what i think if you um spend a lot of time you know thinking about this and studying this um i i remember i, I re recently uh um, heard this idea by stephen pinker of the the curse of knowledge i think he called it that like if you know something it's hard for you to empathize with some somebody that doesn't know that and so it's it's you maybe like uh, leave out things in your explanation because you just assume this is understood by everyone right, so right. so I, i'm just wondering if if you ever um uh thought about like taking a different approach at uh explaining uh your your idea of generic subjective continuity what is in your experience the most the the the, the most um common uh misunderstanding about this usually it's that something personal is getting carried over at which point people object well of course this can't be anything personal carried over so i must be making a mistake and that's an understandable objection but i i, I try to make clear that there's nothing personal carried over i think the way I tried to convey it in the paper, and I think it is fairly easy to grasp, is in terms of the transformation thought experiment, where you you go to sleep and you wake up as a you know slightly changed person, and there's been no interval of unconsciousness. So there's a continuity of experience uh, in which you wake up as as the same person, um, but basically, but slightly changed. And then, as as described in the paper, you. You go down this these steps of waking up uh, as a more and more slightly different person. At, at some point, the person who wakes up after this operation, and remember, there's been no no experience absence of experience between when you go to sleep and when you wake up, right? That's so. This personal continuity, in other words, no interruption of your of your personal experience as a particular person throughout these transformations. Up until the point at which you're trans transformed into a person who is recognizably not you. So you have died as a result of this transformation. But I, I invite the reader to see that there's been no interruption of experience between when you went to were put to sleep and this new person wakes up out of surgery or whatever the transformation is. So this is what I call death by transformation. And I think it's the thought experiment, you know, based on what um, Derek Parfit's book in Reasons and Persons, his book there, uh, should, I think, allow a fairly naive reader to grasp that if you accept that there's no, there's no discontinuity of experience between when you go to sleep as a particular person and wake up as the same person, even if you're somewhat transformed, then there should be no discontinuity when you are when you die by transformation and a new person wakes up. So that so that establishes generic subjective continuity in terms of the thought experiment, and I think it does it very effectively. Uh, and most people can grasp it, but the, the most difficult part is when you think about death and, and the, the last bit of the thought experiment is to say, or that the claim is that regular death and birth is the same thing as death by transformation in this thought experiment right yeah so, i think that is that's okay. like a kind that's, of a big jump that a lot yeah. of people don't are not willing to take yeah right and uh, again uh, as i and i admit this in the paper it's quite understandable that you would sort of resist that last bit of of, of the argument Mm. Uh, because there's no obvious in the in the transformation thought experiment, there's presumably some kind of 
physical person or body or something that's common throughout all the transformations. Even when a new person wakes up with different memories, different personality, maybe even a changed body. Mm. Right? There's nothing the surgeons can't do, I'm hypothesize, that would introduce a blank or emptiness of experience in the transformation. So the person or or even entity that wakes up after the transformation could be completely different. No, so imagine, and that's death, that you, you're no longer there, but there's been no interruption of experience. So if you take that on board, and it seems to me then it at least makes, lends possibility to the idea that when your experience ends at death, you shouldn't anticipate nothingness, which again, you may think most people don't anticipate nothingness. Okay, fine. Even if, but if then what what should you anticipate? If I were in the tr transformation thought experiment, I would anticipate that the surgeon would say, Clark, you're going to die because we're, we're going to change. You're going to be transformed into a dis different person. You won't exist at the end of this transformation. So what should I, Tom, anticipate? I would anticipate experience in the context of this new person, which I've been transformed into. And I want to say that at death, there's no obvious successor, obviously. There's no successor into which the dead person is transformed. But like me in the thought experiment, in the, uh, I, the person who dies shouldn't anticipate any interruption in experience. Mm. They right. just won't know. I, I know that the surgeon is going to transform me. Into, and he could even tell me, Clark, you could be transformed into someone with, with these characteristics. And I would say, oh, okay. So the next experience after the after you're done doctor is going to be this kind of uh, in this context now the, the, with birth, death and birth we have no such assurance about what the next context is going to be all i can say all i'd like to claim is that there's going to be experience of some sort right because and as and as i also say i mean this is part of the paper that doesn't get talked about very much but i I hammer home the point that experience is never absent for itself, that you've never not been here as far as you're concerned. And right. you will never, ever find yourself absent because that's mm. just an impossibility. Mm. An experiencing creature, you know? Right. So anyway, that's that's how it would try to, to convince someone that, uh, well, about what to, what to anticipate at death. Mm. And, and like, uh... A more um, radically um, conclusion that you could draw from this is also that even if everyone, uh, you know, dropped dead at once uh, uh, for some reason, I don't know, a nuclear catastrophe, and then uh, hundreds of years later or billions of years later, whatever, in a galaxy far away, a new alien life form came into existence, that then th this gap in between would just be bridged instantaneously because again like consciousness never ceases to exist from its own perspective right exactly and that of course sounds mystical i mean there's no way around the fact that this does sound a bit a bit crazy from a naturalistic standpoint but that's where i'm led and uh you know i just have to admit yeah it, it does sound it, it it's a little weird sounding but if if you if you grant that consciousness ne it, consciousness is never absent for itself, then that's that's where I'm led. And by the way, it isn't just organic beings that could be conscious; it could be artificial intelligences. And we're you know, the, and an interesting question now it's it's confronting us more and more is is the possibility of artificial consciousness. My guess is that artificial consciousnesses are probably more numerous than biological consciousnesses, perhaps because they'll survive longer. But at any rate, at any rate, whatever the story there is, uh, what we should anticipate at death is all these possibilities of being a sentient being. Um, it's kind of strange, but mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah. Uh, so it's that. That's why at, at the end of the paper I said, it's, it, as you referred to, the radical refreshment of subjectivity is what what we should anticipate at death. Right. Um. um so, you, I, I don't think you mentioned anything about uh, morality or ethical Im implications of that uh, I, that particular idea in that article, but 
I, I, I think I, I remember watching a, a conversation that you had with uh, some other YouTuber that is really engaged in this topic. I think his name is Ted. Um, yeah, Ted. Mm -hmm. and Ebola. You, you talked about these, uh, like the, the, the ethical implications that this could have on, on like the way we treat animals, for instance, or just, you know, um, other people in, in general. Um, could you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I actually Ted and, and some others have brought this to my attention. I hadn't really thought about it that much. Although at the, in the paper, I do suggest that maybe it would be preferable that this were not true because then we could look forward to a blankness or emptiness. And in a way it's kind of, uh, for those of us who don't particularly enjoy being sentient and that could include many features, the uh, the idea that death is not the end of experience can be a little disconcerting. You know, we we want to we'd we'd like this veil of tears not to continue. Unfortunately, that's not in the cards or the way I see it. So, the ethical um, implication is that since consciousness is never going to not find itself present, it's always going to be present for itself. Therefore, it behooves us to make life as uh, minimize suffering as much as possible. Um, so that, you know, I, I think, I mean, there are other reasons, of course, to want to minimize suffering. Uh, that's, this is simply a, perhaps another reason. If, if you, if you think that, uh, consciousness is always present for itself, then, uh, in, that in a way it's inextinguishable, uh, or eternal, then you're going to want to try to create the conditions for conscious beings that are the, uh, as pleasant as possible, involving the least suffering. Um, but uh, uh, that I, I'm not sure that you don't you don't need to go use the generic subjective continuity argument to make that to make that point. But I think it it kind of follows. Yeah, it's kind of one just one more reason to be ethical towards other uh, sentient beings. Right, and, and and also, at you can't at death suppose that you're out of the game. <laughs> you know that that's what people think. They think climate change is not going to affect me. Well, that's true as a particular person, but it isn't as if when you die, there aren't going to be <laughs> this whole raft of conscious beings dealing with climate change. All the kids being born these days, um, and you as a particular person are not going to experience it, but there will be experience of it. So anything you do now to help make the transition into a sustainable planet where we, you know, the, the and mitigate the effects of climate change and other uh, environmental and political disasters, war, famine, anything you do uh, actually will make a difference. And you can't suppose that your death is in any way going to sort of take you out of the picture as, as consciousness. <laughs> mm. It's going to continue, yeah. and so that, that that I guess is just kind of getting at the ethical implications. Um, but again, it, it, some people might find this either absurd or, or just too 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 far out. But yeah. there it is. It's kind of bad news for somebody who kind of just wants to put an end to his life because he he basically can't. Like, there's no escaping from consciousness, is there? Well, you know, this is an inter interesting point. I've had debates with with Ted Boa and others um, about this, and, and it it brings up the work of, of I think it's a David Benatar, um, who's the philosopher who's written about the um, it, it being better not to have been born, and he thinks uh, Benatar, I think he's in uh, South Africa, philosopher who's written a couple of books on this, thinks it's better not to have been born because. Um, Essentially, there's because consciousness involves suffering, therefore it would be it behooves us not to have children. So he's an antinatalist, right? He thinks it's a mistake to bring other consciousnesses into this world. And I have some sympathy with that idea. And the fact that the fact that if you're suffering and say you commit suicide, I mean people do that, and it's sad, it's very sad. But it might be the rational thing to do if, if suffering is bad enough and there's no respite from it and you can't be helped and you've really explored all the alternatives, then death, your autonomy in dying, I think, is a really important right to have. And if things get bad enough, yeah, you should be able to 
to put an end to it yourself uh, with the aid of doctors. But that doesn't, that that's true, right? So it doesn't mean that the end of that suffering isn't perhaps a real end. end to that particular end to that suffering. suffering. Yeah, mm -hmm. end to that suffering. So I think the antinatalist argument does have force. Um, it isn't it isn't undercut by saying that there's there's no way to escape this experience because after all uh the experience that might be escaped at death might be a very unpleasant one right so and, and to bring new creatures into this world that are conscious might involve benatar argues involve suffering that really isn't justifiable uh if we thought about it carefully um, and people, of course, agree or disagree on that. Um, I haven't, I haven't really made up my mind about it. But um, that doesn't the, the the fact of generic subjective continuity, in my opinion, does not count against Benatar's argument. Um, I think Ted thinks it does. Uh, so, uh, and and others might think it does. But I think there are individual consciousnesses that involved a lot of suffering and to bring those to an end is to eliminate that quantum of suffering mm. even if there's no escape from the experience generically right right okay. maybe that's how i put it but um it's it's an interesting argument i'm uh, i haven't i don't think i've completely thought it through uh, but i'm sort of in the midst of it uh, talking with ted and others uh, about this, but I, I tend to think that Bennett, uh, I don't think that generic subjective continuity um, undermines Benatar's argument. Right. As I've just explained. Uh, the problem is uh, the, the Zoom meeting is about to end, so if you don't mind, I'll send you another link so we have a little more time because it's, it's going yeah. to shut down soon. Okay. You also did a, a podcast on uh, Annika uh, with Annika Harris on, on GSC. Uh, I, I haven't uh, watched that or listened to it yet, but I, I was just wondering uh, how that uh, went. Or um, she's probably pretty open to the, to this sort of idea. Yeah, uh, she. It's not come out yet. I. It, it. She's done interviews with a number of people on consciousness. Um, some actually very well known people, and uh, she was kind enough to. Include me at least. Uh, I mean, we had this conversation. I don't know how much will be included in what eventually gets released. I think she's doing a. It's being edited and put together as a uh, as a pod a, a presentation, uh, and it'll be audio, not video. An audio uh, presentation on consciousness. So I I I think it's going to be out in the next within the next year, is my guess. So, but yeah, we talked about uh, consciousness, generic subjective continuity, uh, a little bit about naturalism, uh, that kind of thing. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be interesting. I, I've re re reviewed her book, uh, Conscious, uh, at the Naturalism website. Um, so you can check that out. And uh, but uh, from what from the people that she's she's talked to, I think it's it's going to be a very interesting presentation when it when it finally gets done. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it as well because I, I heard that you did it at a time uh, some time ago already. So I was just wondering what what yeah. where I could find it because I, I didn't see it anywhere. So yeah, yeah, no, it's not out yet, but um, I'm sure you'll you'll hear about it um, when it when it does come out. Um, I'll certainly link to it. Um, so j just to play uh, devil's advocate, it's um something I, I thought about uh, because the uh, Ted came to this idea of uh, GSC completely separate from you. He, he said he, um, when his brother died, he kind of uh, thought about you know, where is he now? And um, then he came to the conclusion, okay, his experience can't just end. And so this to me um, could like give, um, reason to to accuse people of uh, that it's kind of just uh, wishful thinking that people are engaged in um so uh because i know that's something that sam harris uh, also uh, was confronted with after he he read your article on his podcast um so is that something 
what, what do you say to these people that say, yeah, that's that, that's just something that um, uh, uh, people need to believe in because they don't have the consolation of religion or the belief in an afterlife? Um, what, what do you say to that? Um, well, I, you know, <laughs> I think as we discussed, it's not necessarily a pleasant prospect to suppose that there is only experience, right? Uh, in fact, you know, I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that I really wish there were oblivion or blackness <laughs> at death and not, not more damn experience. But uh, so I don't think it's wishful thinking to suppose that there's more experience after death. It's simply what is, I think, plausibly the case when you think about it carefully. Uh, taking all the facts about consciousness into account and the transformation thought experiment. I can't emphasize enough. If people are confused about this idea, it's really important that they read the paper and work through the thought experiment very carefully. To me, that it's that's the... And, and that isn't wishful thinking. It's simply a matter of logic, right? If you accept that there's no gap between when you fall asleep or go under the knife in an operating room and wake up in the recovery room, if you accept that and you work through the transformation thought experiment, you're going to see that your death from transformation doesn't allow any end to experience. There'll still be experience. And then the question is, is the same thing true for birth and then death? Now, Ted's, the death of a, of a person like Ted's brother you know, it's tragic, and we, we might want to think that they're continuing on in some sense. Well, we're wrong about that. Ted's brother is gone. He doesn't exist. There's no con there's no experience happening in the context of Ted's brother anymore, which is a sad thing for Ted and, and for the people who knew his brother. Very sad. But the generic subjective continuity is not wishful thinking that would make up in any way for the death of, a, of someone you love. It's just not. It's um, so Ted might have been led to this thought by his brother's death, but it isn't wishful thinking about where has my brother gone. It's simply to realize, oh, let me start thinking about death. What does it mean to that he's dead? And then what would it mean if I die? And then what happens? You know, what should I think? What should I anticipate? This is the way I like to put it. What should I anticipate as an experiencing being at death? What is next? Think about it. <laughs> really take that question to heart and and then and then do some thinking about it. I, and it may be, as you said right up front, that most people don't have the intuition of being driven into oblivion or blackness. Great. Fine. Then what should be anticipated at death? If it's not nothingness, it's going to be something, right? Mm, mm. <laughs> or at least that's my suggestion. And I don't think it's outlandish. Right. I, I think it, it, it's kind of um, in line with our general intuition, actually, that there's not nothingness after death. Because you see this with, with these many dif different uh, religions that all have a notion of the afterlife. So I think that's that's kind of a very natural thing uh, to because it's just impossible to to imagine not existing you know as you said it's right. just uh, it's an uh, eternal fact of existence to exist uh, so yeah it, it, it's um it's, it's kind of um intuitive in that way actually i think yeah i mean i think what as it's often said uh, as mark Twain said wonderful quote uh I was, I, I think, I'm not sure if she said dead, but I wasn't around for billions of years before I was born, and I was, I was not inconvenienced in the least. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, just perfect way to say, it. you know, what, what was the time like before you were born? Well, um, uh, I, I have no way, I, I can't, we can't grasp that. And why? Because we're always here. Experience is always present for itself, so it cannot grasp the the idea of non-existence for itself and in fact it is it can't be non-existent for itself you know it's a, it, it, 
it's a very strange, strange idea. I mean, um, but the main thing is, if if you for, for, number one, don't anticipate nothingness. There's no blackness or oblivion awaiting you with death. And then, if that's true, what should you anticipate? What what do you put in its place? And the obvious fact is that the conscious beings, Ted, continued his consciousness continued after his brother's death. So obviously, consciousness continues after death, and the, given the fact that other conscious beings exist. But uh, it's it's the from the point of view of the person who's about to die. That's that's the interesting thing, uh, because you can't help. <laughs> Here you are. You've got a minute to live. Someone's got a gun to your head. You're about to be executed. What? What's next? That's the question. And it, it's a question that we all have to face. And if you've not thought about it, well, I, I'm sure everyone thinks about it at some point. Yeah, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not immortal. You know, the, each, each of us as persons is finite. And so we have to face this question. And it's an interesting one. Um, and to sort of brush it aside uh, is, well, I mean, people do. And, 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 or they substitute an afterlife where the person continues in some sense, some kind of reincarnation or, or existing in heaven. Um, that's what mo you know, most religionists feel like there is personal, there's going to be personal continuity in the afterlife. Well, as naturalists, that's not an option. It's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, so do, 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 uh, do, I was wondering if you take issue at, at the fact I titled um, my YouTube video about this idea as uh, a secular argument for rebirth, just because I thought the title sounded good. But uh, I was wondering if what do you say to that? Because you never, you know, use the word rebirth in your article, of course. So is that yeah. misleading to to use that word? Or yeah, I I think it is because rebirth inevitably connotes the reincarnation of the the person who died so i yeah i i think that's pretty misleading it would be i'm not it isn't we are it isn't we are reincarnation it isn't rebirth it's simply um the continuation of experience but uh not in the context of the person who dies so and i don't know <laughs> that's why generic subjective continuity has become sort of the the phrase that captures or tries to capture that intuition. I'm I'm not sure that it's ideal, but it's kind of gotten out there. Right. And, and it's con contrasted with personal subjective continuity, which we all have from the moment we're born to the moment we die as particular persons. Mm, yeah. But I I was wondering, um maybe you know more about this, but uh, what uh, in the Buddhist tradition uh, people understand as rebirth because um, as I understand it that it's possible if you're a Buddhist to um, get uh, reborn as a snake for instance so I, I don't think that Buddhists would think then that there's any kind of personal subjective continuity because of course you you'd be, you'd be a snake you, you wouldn't have the same desires and memories uh, as a human so maybe um like what, what do maybe people uh, of different uh worldviews actually have the same or a similar understanding of rebirth as the this G gsc what do you think well, yeah i don't generally not I, I think the idea of rebirth or reincarnation usually involves some kind of personal element that for instance in the hindu tradition karma your um the idea is that depending on, on how you live your life in this life, your next life after your death will be either elevated in a higher ca caste, if you're, a, a, it, say you're in, in India, you're uh, say a lower caste, um, uh, untouchable, but you live an exemplary life and then you die, you might be born as a higher caste. But you were saying, uh, the, the idea also is in some of these traditions that you might be reborn as, say, an animal, <laughs> something not, not even human because of what you did. But so the idea would still be that there's something, uh, some a kernel of, of a particular person or you that's carried over. After all, you deserved because of the life, the life you led to be reborn as a snake. 
So mm. I agree. This is a little, little sketchy. What about a snake could be continuous with me as a person and, and you know maintain some kind of personal subjective continuity, personal continuity? Well, you have to believe in some kind of soul, I suppose, some kernel that's in that could be transmitted from me, the person who dies, the say the human who behaved badly and then gets reincarnated in the, the snake. So it it's not a coherent idea, obviously, that I can see, but it's you know, if you think vaguely enough about what it means to be a soul or a, a spirit, then maybe you can buy the, the idea of reincarnation as it's um, been handed down from in the, say, the Vedic or the, not the Vedic tradition, but certainly in the Hindu tradition. Buddhists, I don't think, are so much into, uh, depending on the, on the school of Buddhism, I don't think they're into reincarnation in that sense, because they don't suppose so much yeah, that there is a soul or a spirit that's could could be reincarnated, mm, mm. but uh, I'm no expert in that. But that's that's kind of what I I, I would say. Uh, reincarnation reincarnation being more of a um, Hindu uh, rather than a Buddhist um, conception. Mm, mm. Uh, I was interested. Uh, what are your um, like? Uh, what would we say? What would you say? Philosophical forebears, like your um, philosophical uh, inf influences, um, particularly for for GSC, because I, I heard um, Alan Watts um, has a similar idea, and then uh, I was just wondering what led you up to to GSC and what what kind of uh, books and um, uh, philosophical ideas you entertained before that. Yeah, well, well, Alan Watts was one of my influences. In fact, years ago, um, I actually hosted briefly a radio show in which he played Alan Watts tapes. I was the host of the show. We would take calls. We would play a tape and then discuss. You know, the callers would would call in with questions, and we would have, uh, you know, a, 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 as a regular radio talk show. So that was that was good fun. And so I, uh, and I, we had a retreat, a couple of retreats for uh, for something called the Alan Watts Fellowship. So I was very much involved in Alan Watts uh, philosophy, still like it a lot. He was a great expositor of, of Eastern philosophy to the West, still is. And, and it's wonderful. His his tapes are being played, his talks are being played on YouTube now. His son, Mark Mark Watts, is is, is doing that. So his, his work lives on and, ha and has been an influence for me. And then Western philosophy, um, starting the work of D.F. Skinner, I, I admired him as a uh, exponent of a view of, of a naturalistic view of ourselves as, as uh, that carries it into work on free will. Uh, and then Dan Dennett at Tufts, I, I studied briefly at Tufts University, and uh, Dennett was my advisor. Uh, so his work, certainly, and work on consciousness. Derek Parfit, actually, I'm proud to say that Derek Parfit read the paper. Uh, on death and nothingness, and gave you some uh, criticisms, criticisms of it, and uh, which from which it benefited. So, and it was based on his work, uh, his his thought experiments about uh, personal identity. Mm. Um, and a guy named Eli Hirsch, I don't know if he's still around. He was a professor at Tufts, uh, no, sorry, Brandeis, Brandeis University. Uh, so I took a course with him. So those are some, those are some early influences. Um, but essentially, Western Western philosophy of mind and Buddhism mm. and Alan Watts, mm. certainly. Um, because you you mentioned uh, Dan Dennett, uh, what do you make of his conception of consciousness? Because it's pretty different from from yours uh, yours and mine. And I I remember I was watching a, a TED talk that he gave on uh, explaining consciousness, and I think he just. Uh, completely missed the mark i mean he was like giving a, a, a talk on a completely different topic i felt like um so what do you make of his conception he, I, my understanding is he completely denies this hard problem of consciousness he says there is none it's just all um you can just explain it in terms of a, a mechanistic uh thing but maybe i'm misunderstanding or misrepresenting his views I don't... no i mean um uh... Dennett is an illusionist, and the illusionists, and they're, you know, they're a growing bunch of philosophers, and, and their 
their claim is is that phenomenal consciousness, the idea that consciousness has qualitative feel to it, is an illusion. There's nothing qualitative mm -hmm. about consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they often talk about it is they use the word qualia, which originally was a, a philosophical term that pointed to the qualitative aspect of experience. But now the word qualia has been burdened with all kinds of uh, philosophical connotations, namely um, non-physicalism or dualism, or something like that. So I don't. I try not to talk about quality. I simply talk about qualities of experience, like pain and, and sweet, red, all the sensory experience that that we talked about um, earlier. So Dennett is saying, <clears throat> and and uh, his other illusionists like Keith Frankish, there, and and there are many of them these days say that no, there's nothing qualitative about pain. You might think that there's a qualitative feel to pain, but that's actually an illusion. All that exists are, and there's nothing private about consciousness either, because it's, it's since it's physical, there's nothing specifically private or subjective about my experience. It's only the, the contingent fact that these brain states happen to be located here, but if we could see all my brain states, you'd be seeing my experience of pain, which I find to be uh, a difficult claim to sustain. Uh, so anyway, that's so I I completely disagree with Dennett and the illusionists because I don't I think qualities are real. The way things feel are where we start in thinking about consciousness. Uh, but uh, I, I and I think the reason that Dennett and other illusionists go this route is because they can't see how physicalism can account for qualities. Mm -hmm. And it's true. There's a <laughs> we don't yet know if if qualities can be assimilated into a physicalist worldview, a, phys a physicalist understanding of what consciousness is. It's an open question. Yeah. Uh, and uh it, there's research ongoing and I may be maybe I'm wrong. It, I <laughs> it could be that there are no qualities to experience. But it really, illusionists will say, Dan, Dan will say, Dan it will say, yeah, it really seems like there's something, a feel to pain. It, it's the hurt that you're feeling. It seems like it's a, a private, uh, qualitative uh, thing that only you have access to. But no, it all, that, that seeming is an illusion. Now, I don't think it's illusory at all. I think it's it, it's exactly what we're confronted with in being conscious creatures. Is yeah. the quality, the aspects of sensations, of its emotions, of you know, even something as subtle as thinking a thought has a phenomenal that is qualitative aspect to it. Um, so anyway, deep, deep fundamental disagreement about what what consciousness is. The illusionists just deny, uh, and I tried to pin them down on this. They just didn't. They they are forced to deny that there are any qualities to experience. Uh, but if you look at the dictionary, uh, you know qual the, the idea of a quality is completely con commonsensical. People know what you mean by sweet pain, the way things feel, the expression of what it's like. That's the that's the way phenomenal consciousness is all always talked about. You know what is it like to feel pain? And that's called phenomenal consciousness. That's what the illusionists like Bennett deny exists. All they say that exists is maybe some functional idea of consciousness um, or, or what Ned Block calls access consciousness. But there's no phenomenal consciousness. Okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've tried to do my, you know, I, I, I've argued that they're dead wrong and that the, the case is, the, the question is still open. How do we account for qualities, phenomenal qualities? How do we account for experience in a, in a naturalistic setting? And the question is open. We, we don't know yet. And I might be wrong, Dan might be wrong, the illusionists might be wrong, but we cannot <laughs> jump to any conclusion at this point about uh, the fact that, that there, are, there are categorically no qualities. That claim has to be shown as a conclusion of the theory of consciousness. You can't just come out and say there are no qualities, yeah. uh, which, which is, to me, what the illusionists are doing. So, so is what illusionists are saying 
that basically just uh, consciousness in general is not real. It's an, an illusion. Well, they're saying that, no, they're not saying that consciousness is an illusion. They're not saying that experience is an illusion. They're saying it isn't what we think it is. Okay. Uh, it isn't what I'm claiming it is. Okay. So I'm claiming that consciousness has has a feel to it, a sense we feel some qualities, that it's like something to feel pain, that it that in describing the physical mechanisms of, around pain that are in my head, you're not getting at the essence of pain. The essence of pain is the feeling. And you can't put a feeling on a lab bench, as I think Anil Seth, who's written a great book about consciousness, once put it in a recent debate about consciousness. You can't. Uh, and since you can't do that, that poses a problem, immediate problem for physicalism. Physicalism being the thesis that anything that's real, you could essentially put on a lab bench and look at. Mm -hmm. So, but as a as a naturalist, I don't think we're we're necessarily committed to physicalism as a hypoth as a as a thesis about ultimate reality. And it could be that this is an interesting question, an interesting open question. How how do we incorporate consciousness into a nat naturalist worldview? And is it necessarily the case that physicalism is the is where we end up? I don't think it's necessarily the case, and that does not commit us to any any kind of sort of um, uh, spooky woo or uh, supernaturalism. It's simply to take the question of consciousness seriously as as something to be studied uh, and not uh, ruled out of court simply because you're committed to physicalism as a as a, a metaphysical thesis. Science is not committed to physicalism. Mm -hmm. It's committed to understanding consciousness uh, as we decided uh, to think about it. And most, I'd say the majority still, and it, you know, it, not everyone, but the majority of people thinking about and studying consciousness do think that phenomenal consciousness, the feels of pain, the feel of tasting sugar, the, the, the sensation of red, all of these are real and need accounting for somehow. Mm -hmm. In other words, most folks are not a, a illusionists, but illusionists are, are making a very strong attempt to sort of push back against the idea, the very idea of phenomenal consciousness. Right. Yeah. What do you make of the claim that consciousness itself is an illusion? Because that's something I've also heard. And what would you call that belief? It's it's not. Uh, an illusionist belief, uh, I think you said, but uh, what would you say about this sort of claim? I don't, I wouldn't know how to interpret it. I mean, to say that something, we'd have to decide what we're talking about um, and then say that it's unreal, it doesn't exist. So to say the consciousness doesn't exist would be to say what? That we're not having any experiences right now. That's how I interpret it, yeah. Yeah, it would be to say there's no such thing as experience. There's no such thing as sensations or um, or thought. There are, there are no mental phenomena the way we common sense we think about them as in dreams or or, or, or thoughts or feelings. Um, I just don't see how that's a sustainable thing to say. Um, so I don't know who would say there is no such thing as consciousness. Maybe maybe people do say that. I don't know. I've I've heard it on 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 the on the uh, Making Sense podcast a number of just um like uh, Sam mentioned it as a you know ridiculous kind of uh, argument against his position but yeah yeah I you know I I think Sam, Sam and and I and others do take conscious experiences as that which it's very difficult to doubt the existence of. And this was, a, it's a kind of the Cartesian insight that Descartes said that, you know, this is the one thing he couldn't really doubt. And, you know, I'm with him there. Uh, but it doesn't mean I'm a Cartesian in, in supposing that consciousness has to be something necessarily non physical or necessarily physical. Uh, again, that's an open question. But to say that there is no such thing as consciousness, um, as a, if a conscious creature asserts that, and only conscious creatures could, <laughs> it seems like a, a performative self-contradiction, a performative contradiction, as they say, right? Right. You you you're you're telling me that there's no consciousness, but so you're not conscious right now, and you're telling me there's no consciousness. 
okay, so what is it that's telling me this? Um, there's no experience there. So the, even, the, even the claim that there's no consciousness has to involve an idea, a conception of consciousness, which seems to me to require a conscious creature. But Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the only reason we talk about this problem of consciousness or consciousness in general is that we are conscious and that, that we have direct experience of it and evidence of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. That, that, that's the way Sam Harris usually puts it. So that, that's the one thing that can't be an illusion because if it just, he says he's, it seems like it, but the, the fact that it seems already proves the point. Yeah. Is it there? Right. It, well, the, the illusions would say that the seeming uh, that, yeah, they would say it seems like we have qualitative feels to experience it. But they would say that's a mistake, that we're misrepresenting, uh, that we're making a claim that isn't sustained by any careful analysis of our situation, and that science will not sustain the claim that we're actually having feelings, even though we're claiming to. So again, the illusionists are not denying consciousness. They're denying that consciousness uh, has as uh, an aspect to it something that is qualitative. And that's what they're getting rid of. But they would still say consciousness exists as a sort of a functional, how would they put it? It's, it's physical, it's functional, it's representational. And part of what consciousness does is misrepresent itself as having qualities, or mm -hmm. as they would say, qualia. But mm -hmm. again, we should not talk about qualia because that's a philosophically loaded term that the illusionists bring up in order to debunk the very idea of experiential qualities. But quali the qualities of experience is a commonsensical everyday notion. Uh, it's, it isn't the philo philosophical idea of qualia as necessarily non-physical, as necessarily spooky, as dualist, or anything like that, no. Mm -hmm. So the illusionists, I think, of what they're doing is they're, they're taking a philosophical notion of quality and saying, obviously it's wrong. We, it, we, it doesn't comport with physicalism. Therefore, we can discount the very idea of, of, of experiential qualities, which philosophers call phenomenal, phenomenal consciousness. So, that it's it, it gets what it. I, I think that it's a, a confusion on their part, and they're. Uh, but no one, I don't think, is or very few people, are in the business of des denying consciousness as something that exists. That illusionists claim don't involve a lot. You know, I think it does. Illusions claim it doesn't. Okay. But there's something going on right now <laughs> that both of us are privy to in terms of our own experience, mm -hmm. right? Illusionists have to grant that. Mm -hmm. Dennett grants that. The question is, what is it? Is it, and what does it essentially involve? And they're, they're phenomenologists who say that who in a way agree with the illusions is saying that there's nothing essentially phenomenal about consciousness, that it's essentially intentional. Mm. They put aside the phenomenologists I've been discovering recently, put aside any metaphysical presupposition, say, just look at experience. Mm. Don't do any metaphysics, just look at the nature of your experience and you'll see that's essentially intentional, that is representational. Mm. It's not essentially phenomenal, phenomenal the way I think. Okay. Mm. Fair enough. So again, there are different ideas of what consciousness essentially involves. Mm. But to say there's nothing there, mm. I don't know. You know that's that's where I, I I I plant my flag with Descartes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's the only place I would plant it with with good old Rene, I'm, I'm, since I'm not a dualist. Right. I'm a, I, I, I'm agnostic, metaphysically agnostic, right now. Right. But I stick with science and investigating what consciousness might be. It's, it's an open question. Mm. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but it's been already a very insightful talk. I just want to ask you one last question for my viewers also. Like, uh, what's um, what kind of books uh, or literature apart from from naturalism.org do you recommend to 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 get to know more about consciousness or you know what, what's kind of the 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 
the must read uh, books in that uh, on that topic? Um, a nice book to in introduce people to um, consciousness is Jack Symes. Uh, book that I've reviewed on my website, um, and I'm trying to think of the title of it. It's escaping me. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Forgive me, Jack, if you're listening. Uh, but it's on the. Uh, if you go to the consciousness section of the website, uh, and then scroll down, you'll see to the books that I've reviewed. So Jack Symes' book, uh, he interviews um, very entertaining interviews. By the way, he's done a terrific job here, mm -hmm. and. So all the different views, many different views on consciousness are laid out there. Mm -hmm. So definitely check that one out. And I, um, I'll, I'll, you can put the, the title in, in the notes of this YouTube. Sure, yeah. And then Anil Seth, uh, he's a neuroscientist uh, over in Oxford, UK, has got a terrific book called Being You. I've reviewed that as well. I think it's a terrific read. And then the other uh, book, uh, that I would highly recommend it is by a philosopher named Thomas Metzinger, and it's called the Ego Tunnel. Mm -hmm. I've reviewed that as well. All these books you can find are, the reviews are at the, at the website, and but check them out. Uh, and then Susan Blackmore in the UK has written uh, several books, uh, uh, textbooks actually, including a very long, illustrated, very big textbook uh, on consciousness. So uh, her work should definitely be checked out if you're uh, new to the topic and want an overview. Uh, there's an immense amount of detail of what, what Sue Blackmore has put together in her books. Mm -hmm. And she's also written a very a book called A Very Short Introduction to Consciousness. So if you want that, then um, check that one out. So uh, lots to choose from, but, but and very good stuff that's been written that's come out recently in consciousness. Right. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. I was really happy that you were willing to do this. And again, I was incredibly happy when you commented on my video because I don't know, it's um, you never expect, you know, the the author of the 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 idea that you want to present actually commenting on your video. So that that was a surreal moment. So thank you so much for that. Oh well, I'm you know I'm I'm really pleased that you're interested in this stuff. That the, you know you're getting the word out about this crazy idea. And you're a naturalist, obviously, I think. And so, and you're interested in consciousness. So how could I resist commenting on your uh, on your YouTube? It was impossible. I could not have done otherwise. <laughs> Gets into free will, another topic. Uh, so good. Chris, thank you for, for having me on. It's good to talk with you. And I, I look forward to the uh, the finished product. Let me know Great. when it's done. Yeah, I will, I will send you an email once I upload it. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, man. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.